It is my pleasure to introduce uh, David Banks, who is a member of the uh, Joint Institute for Computational Sciences, which is shared between uh, Oak Ridge National Labs and the University of Tennessee. He also spent a year as a visiting professor of uh, radiology at uh, Harvard Medical School, um, working on uh, tools for visualization of uh, 3D MRI of the brain. Thank you. So the title of my talk is uh, Show Me What's Wrong Inside Making 3D Medical Data Accessible to Everyone. <clears throat> and it's motivated by the following question, which is what will happen when people routinely put their 3D medical scans on the web? <clears throat> and the outline of the talk goes like this. I'll show you briefly some of the work in our lab. I'll give you a 2D example of, <clears throat> the, uh, of my imagined scenario. I'll make an analogy with uh, hurricane forecasting. I'll show you a 3D example. <clears throat> so some of the work in our lab includes uh, simulating motion of uh, the skeleton. This is a project by uh, a student, Joseph Caloza, together with uh, Andy Payer from National Library of Medicine to develop an interactive tool to let, uh, let you manipulate uh, joints in a skeletal model. <clears throat> Here's an example of a visualization of microscopy data. So the, the way this works is that uh, uh, my colleagues prepared tissue from the hippocampus of a mouse <clears throat> and put it on the stage of a confocal microscope. I uh, went to great effort to keep that tissue alive while it was being repeatedly scanned over the course of about an hour. So uh, the scans are uh, roughly six minutes apart in time. And after registering the 3D scans and producing uh, uh, surface representations of the membranes of the uh, neurons, we can produce images like this one. You can see individual dendrites. One of them is labeled. These are the vertical structures, the long, thin twigs. And on their sides, you can see spines. So these are dendritic spines which are forming synapses with other uh, dendrites not seen because not every neuron was labeled uh, fluorescently. And there's this little interesting feature uh, sticking out here, <clears throat> which is called a philopodium, and it makes a, it makes a, a transient appearance during the uh, hour-long time series microscopy of this, uh, of this mouse neuron. <clears throat> And we were interested in showing the time-varying nature of this short-lived process. You can see it budding out uh, from uh, these small bumps on the, on the, appearing on the side of the spine of, of the dendrite. <clears throat> uh, evidently, this philopodium was attempting to find a neighbor to synapse with, and in the absence of finding a neighbor who also wanted to form a synapse, the philopodium withdrew. So here's an animation from the actual time series microscopy. And you'll see the philopodium emerge somewhere below this branch. About here, there it was. <clears throat> so it was a short-lived little process and is thought to be uh, at the heart of neural plasticity, how new synapses are forming. Uh, here's work by Israel Huff uh, in our lab. Uh, to visualize molecular dynamic processes. This is simply water at equilibrium, room temperature. And one interesting question to us is whether we could combine the two, whether we could combine a molecular dynamic simulation together with actual geometry coming from confocal microscopy. And here is a, a frame from such a simulation by <clears throat> Brad Futch. Our lab has also been working with uh, researchers at Harvard Medical School to develop improved tools for visualizing the white matter fiber structure inside the brain. This is derived from diffusion MRI uh, brain data. So we're interested in these fibers, the wiring inside the brain, and how to properly display them. <clears throat> so that's the background of some of the, the work in our lab. And you'll see as the talk progresses how that sort of feeds into uh, our imagined view of what things might be like when people routinely upload very large 3D uh, biomedical data sets onto the web. <clears throat> so first I'll start with a 2D example, which goes something like this. <clears throat> Here is a 14-year-old male before ski trip, 
And this is an image of the 14-year-old male after the ski trip. And of course, what I want you to note is the fracture in the clavicle here. Uh, the, the arm is being held in an arm sling, and you can see a safety pin from that. <clears throat> so here's, a, here's an x-ray, a 2D image of, uh, of this fracture. And of course, that 14-year-old is my 14-year-old, so this is, a, this is a, an actual anecdotal story. <clears throat> Fractured clavicle. Uh, he sees two different orthopedists. Uh, one recommends one procedure, uh, perform surgery, install plates to, uh, to repair the break. <clears throat> and the other offers different advice, which is simply to immobilize the arm in a sling for a few weeks and let it heal on its own. <clears throat> so the patient is left with a choice between two possible procedures and, of course, wants to know what's the best outcome. <clears throat> so like many patients, uh, this one searches the web for images matching clavicle and finds anatomical images, which are helpful for educational purposes, but also finds that many people have uploaded x-rays of their own broken clavicles. And now there's this interesting hunt that begins to try and find an x-ray that looks like his. Who has a similar bone break and what did they do? <clears throat> Here is, uh, here's an x-ray someone has kindly uploaded that shows the result of following uh, procedure number one, surgery with, uh, with, with pins to, uh, to set the fracture. So if we imagine the space of all clavicles, I'll call it C of T, this is a, a time-dependent uh, 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 data set. So these would be clavicles T days after a fracture. So C of zero is, uh, is the picture that we've got. This is immediately after the fracture. And we're interested in the possible views of uh, C90. What will that clavicle look like after 90 days of healing? So here's, here's our space. This is C of zero. This is people who have recently sustained a fracture. Lots of images that you can find by searching on the web. And each of these uh, images conceptually is just a point in that space. So here's a space populated by a bunch of dots. Each dot corresponds to a picture, and each picture corresponds to a fracture. So here's some sampling of the set C of zero. Now, a, a, a fractured clavicle follows a trajectory over time, and that's illustrated by this arrow mapping one particular image in this set, C of zero, over to a, a particular image that's in the set, C of 90. So we can imagine that this, this clavicle follows a trajectory over the course of 90 days, and we've taken a snapshot twice before and after the healing process. <clears throat> Of course, there are many trajectories here uh, that have been sampled by individuals fracturing their clavicle. <clears throat> Some of these trajectories uh, follow procedure P1. These are illustrated with the red arrows. And some of these uh, clavicles follow a trajectory along procedure P2. <clears throat> these are indicated by the blue arrows that terminate at the blue dots. So just to remove some of the clutter, <clears throat> there perhaps are other fractured clavicles that follow neither of these two hypothetical procedures, P1 and P2. But now we restrict ourselves just to those clavicles that followed P1 or P2, and we wonder what, you know, what turned out to be the best outcome. And not just in general, <clears throat> but for those sets of outcomes, which ones emanate from the subset of original fractured clavicles like the case we care about, our 14-year-old who was on a, a ski trip. So if we limit our original set just to those injuries that were similar to the one that we care about, and then look at the trajectories that emanate from within this subset of, uh, of fractures that are, are like the ones of interest to us, <clears throat> then here they are. So the red lines uh, are the the trajectories of fractures like the, the one we care about uh, that follow procedure number one and the blue lines that follow procedure number two. So let's call the, these resulting sets after 90 days little P1 and little P2, and they're surrounded by a cloud of capital P1 and capital P2, which would be all of the fractures that had uh, followed these two trajectories.
So in order to make a decision based on these samples that one might find on the web, <clears throat> there's this basic algorithm that one might apply, which begins with finding images like mine, clustering trajectories into ensembles, and examining the ensemble outcomes to see whether there ten tends to be a superior outcome with procedure one or with procedure two. <clears throat> so one limitation of this basic sort of web-driven uh, enterprise is that the imagery is not densely sampled in time, so you can't really follow someone's uh, clavicle over the course of 90 days. They didn't image it uh, every night, every day, and even if they did, they probably didn't upload it every day. <clears throat> and there's the basic question of what exactly my clavicle will do, given these these observations of data points out there. It would, it would be nice to have some sort of predictive value uh, related to my particular case. And it could be that my case is an outlier, <clears throat> and that the outcome of following a procedure will be different than. Uh, those that I've observed. So that brings me to my hurricane analogy, <clears throat> which works something like this. The idea is that a clavicle trajectory is, is something like a hurricane's trajectory <clears throat> for which historical observational data is available. So here we're seeing the paths of many, many hurricanes over time. This is over something like a century of time. You can see that there are paths for category fives in the Pacific uh, in a fairly dense grouping, <clears throat> less so in the Atlantic and in, uh, in, in the Gulf of Florida. So based on these uh, aggregate observational data points, one might choose a place to live that might have more or less hazard. <clears throat> and one would know this in advance. And one might limit the, uh, the observed trajectories to a region of interest. Here, for example, are all the hurricanes or hurricane remnants that have passed through or near the state of Missouri over uh, the past 100 years or so. <clears throat> but one might also predict the possible paths for a particular hurricane. So this would not just be uh, a query based on observed data. This would be uh, simulations based on uh, a computational model for the physics of, uh, of hurricanes <clears throat> in which one might generate possible paths according to some uh, stochastic conditions. So here's a particular hurricane, and it might go any number of different ways over the next few days, and these possible paths are indicated by different colors. So the analogy that, uh, that I'm meaning to draw here is that these trajectories can be con considered something like <clears throat> the future trajectory of a particular malady. Maybe it's a, a broken clavicle, maybe it's something else. And that given <clears throat> initial conditions based on one's uh, medical scan fed into a simulation, one might predict various possible outcomes and assign a probability density to different, uh, different points in this abstract space of, for example, clavicles over time. <clears throat> so in this analogy, we have an observed clavicle. Uh, we have some sort of solver, maybe a, a bone remodeling solver. And we advance forward over time according to procedure P1 or P2. And we look at perhaps ensemble averages based on predictions, not simply uh, observed data. <clears throat> so there are two. Uh, so there are two distinct methods that might be applied to making a decision based on one's uh, medical data. One is to compare it against cohorts, uh, and the other is to actually make predictions based on computational simulation. But it's important to note that we need a 3D volume of initial data, and not just a 2D image. <clears throat> and that brings me to the, uh, the 3D example part of the talk. So in this 3D example, we consider uh, a, a brain tumor that shows up in an MRI scan. <clears throat> and if you don't see the tumor immediately, here it's been highlighted and pointed to by this arrow. <clears throat> 
And perhaps uh, the patient who, uh, who has this tumor has a choice between different procedures to follow. And now it's very important to make the right decision between procedure one and pr procedure two. In the case of a broken clavicle, perhaps both procedures will have comparable outcomes. <clears throat> in the case of the tumor, perhaps they may not, and one would like to know that in advance. <clears throat> so we imagine this scenario where one uh, carries out a similar algorithm as with the 2D example of the broken clavicle, but this case for the case of a brain tumor, and one searches the web for images that match brain tumor. Now there's a huge variety of imagery that results from such a query. <clears throat> the tumor is a much more subtle feature than a fracture, so for a patient to take a look at images that may show up uh, from a web search, uh, they may be much less uh, uh, discernible to the patient than images, say, of uh, x-rays of fractured clavicles. And there's tremendous variable in these 2D images, not just because there's tremendous variability in the possible uh, shapes and locations of the tumors, but because we're looking at 2D slices of a 3D volume. And which particular 2D slice you happen to get can vary from, uh, from patient to patient or diagnosis to diagnosis. <clears throat> so we might consider searching actual 3D scans. So how many 3D scans are there? How, how big is this possible data set? Well, it's estimated that in year 2007, there will be something like 50 million diagnostic MRI scans uh, obtained worldwide. It's something like 20 million in the, in the United States alone. <clears throat> Unlike a typical patient who may be searching for uh, comparable data to one's own, <clears throat> the radiologist has such a database already embedded uh, in, in their thinking. <clears throat> a radiologist knows what normal looks like, and as a result, spends less than seven minutes on average reading an MRI scan. By comparison, a patient may want to spend much more time not only browsing uh, their own scan, uh, but also seeing the imagery in 3D and comparing to other scans. <clears throat> so here's, here's an example, just to bring this home. <clears throat> this is a patient uh, diagnosed with a brain tumor. This is shown in green. And you can see how this tumor sits with respect to the vasculature and the fiber tracts surrounding it. If we zoom in, <clears throat> on a region of interest uh, here at the top of the tumor, we can see where some of these fibers infiltrate the tumor itself. <clears throat> now this has, this has implications for the patient as well as for the, uh, the intervention. If the tumor is removed or irradiated, including the periphery, some of these fibers necessarily will be sacrificed. And these fibers connect to regions of the cortex that perform certain functions. So the, the patient perhaps would be interested in seeing here are fibers that possibly innervate the, uh, the speech center of the brain. By removing the tumor, we will damage these fibers and there will be a resulting loss in the ability to speak. <clears throat> Being able to see this in 3D is, uh, is perhaps important for a patient who is uh, evaluating possible treatment options. And being able to compare one's own particular uh, set of geometries to those of other patients would be potentially useful and empowering as well. <clears throat> so what we're imagining is this basic uh, algorithm that uh, patients may wish to be able to follow, <clears throat> where they begin with the space capital S of all MRI, 3D MRI images restricted to the space little s of those that happen to be like mine, for example. And then following a trajectory over time, according to procedure P1, of those scans like mine that follow option number one versus those scans over time that followed option number two. <clears throat> so I'm thinking about how this process might work. There would be individuals who first upload their MRI data 
and then wish to view it. Then find and view data from cohorts uh, within procedures P1 and P2, that is, people who had a pathology like mine, who then subscribed to procedure one or procedure two, and what it looked like, their, what their MRI looked like after those procedures were performed. <clears throat> Based on these data points, together with the computational simulation, it might be interesting to a patient to simulate uh, one's own possible trajectory or family of trajectories, possible outcomes over time of following procedure one or procedure two. <clears throat> which, uh, which then leads to consideration of how, how large a database uh, are we talking about to store the very, very many millions of scans that are performed each year. So roughly 10 to the seven scans per year that let's estimate 10 to the ninth bytes uh, would be something like 10 petabytes of storage, which would raise issues of data movement for that, uh, that quantity of data. Uh, it raises questions about how to actually perform 3D queries on MRI data sets. This is an active area of research for many people. <clears throat> how to provide visualization services so that having uploaded an MRI data set one could then see a reasonable 3D representation of the geometry it contains. <clears throat> Coupled perhaps with simulation services, that is given a particular uh, representation of the geometry, how might that geometry evolve over time subject to physics and biological processes? And, and of course, how to maintain confidentiality and anonymity for these, these data sets. There's one other lurking issue here, which is to validate the data. <clears throat> if, uh, if individuals are free to uplo upload their data and characterize it in the way that say, they see fit, uh, those characterizations may or may not be apt. But the payoffs for this, uh, this possibility of many people uploading their 3D MRI data would include having a large searchable repository of 3D MRI data sets, which would be valuable for patients for their personal use, would be valuable for medical research, and would permit uh, the population of patients to be better informed and more empowered. <clears throat> so to summarize, there are millions of MRI scans out there. There's an opportunity to empower patients to not only view their, their MRI scans in ways that a radiologist might not, but also to compare their MRIs to their cohorts and possibly follow uh, the outcomes of different procedures that they're entertaining. <clears throat> also to simulate possible trajectories via a computational simulation. <clears throat> and. Uh, the, the basis for this, this kind of imagined world of uploading 3D medical imagery to the web uh, it was due to collaborations with a number of individuals, uh, including Kevin Beeson, Charles Wimet, Karen Dietz, uh, Carl Frederick Weston, Gordon Kendallman at uh, Rhythm and Hughes FSU and Harvard Medical School. the sampling of this space of, of imagery. One is about patients making wrong conclusions and one is about possible bias. <clears throat> so, yeah, I mean, th these are all appropriate uh, and interesting to think about as sort of a thought experiment. For the first, for sampling, 
Uh, when, when I imagine the scenario, <coughs> I imagine it being staged, where the first stage involves seeding this collection of data sets. So why would individuals want to upload their, their personal medical data? And yet they do already uh, with, for example, x-rays uh, that you can see. <clears throat> if there is some potential payoff for uploading your 3D scan, then that might be reason enough to, uh, to seed this data set. For example, if by uploading your 3D uh, MRI, you're able to see some nice visualization of the result, then you might just want to subscribe to that service, and then that would begin to seed the pool. As far as, uh, as bias, th this will be an inherently biased system because people without pathologies are less likely to be scanned. So we already know up front that there will be certain biases. As far as being able to correctly categorize uh, these scans, that is, <clears throat> here's a scan that shows a certain pathology, the patient was a certain age, and so forth. Uh, this is an issue that has to do with the medical records that are associated with that scan. There are some hospitals that are beginning to experiment with having patients' uh, genetic information associated with their records, <clears throat> which may or may not be an adjunct to their 3D uh, scan information, which would perhaps bolster the validation part. And as far as the um, empowering of patients, I think that's probably here to stay, that patients are going to be more and more opinionated about their, their trajectories. And, and I think that's just the nature of medicine in the foreseeable future. The question is whether there is a repository now of data sets like this. <clears throat> there are several. And of course, they're sequestered because of issues of confidentiality. Uh, one, of the, one of the important uses for these databases is to establish what normal is. So there are atlases being constructed based on uh, scan data. And there are cohorts that are being imaged uh, at set time intervals over a span of up to 10 years. So there are a number of different groups that are doing this now. Uh, and, and the idea here is to take this notion and go large. Yes? The, the comment is about the, the value of the, uh, the descriptive information as well as the image information, and that certainly is the case. <clears throat> For this picture where one might forecast the future traje trajectory of one's own data, uh, I guess it would be important for that 3D imagery to be available. Uh, so this question is about, uh, about data March. and bandwidth. How long would it take to, to upload a data, data set uh, of this size? I guess, you know, it's comparable to uploading a, a video. Uh, a video is a bunch of slices of 2D images, and, and this would be as well. So this would be a nice, healthy, you know, uh, high-resolution video. Yes. I suspect that 
queries about the eventual outcome for my particular broken clavicle will only be answered with confidence if you can actually simulate how that bone modeling will take place, you know, a 3D computational simulation, because the observational data is just too sparse. Um, as far as issues about things like range of motion resulting from, or amount of pain or uh, appearance, cosmetic issues, again, I think that the simulation is really, I mean, <clears throat> the idea that one might upload a 3D scan and then with various computational tools predict what will happen in the future based on this particular observation of one's 3D state, uh, I think is, is incredibly exciting. Yes. What's the current I'm sort of following on another question here? Is that what in terms of the current state of if I upload if I manage to upload this data uh, and I want to visualize it, are there tools out there right now that could actually do this you know, rapid fast quickly to get this stuff and upload it to the state of the state? This is a question about how long it will take just to produce a, a decent visualization of one's MRI data. So that's actually how this whole thing got kicked off. I had posters up on the wall of various visualizations of biomedical data, and a colleague of mine said, you know, I hurt my shoulder, and I got it scanned. Can you make one of those pictures for me of my data? I said, well, I don't see why not. He brings it in on a CD, and so we start to work on, on uh, making images. And this is complicated by a number of things. There are dropped images in the sequence. They're out of order. There are gaps. And it takes a fair amount of manual processing. So just to automate that task is, is non-trivial. How long would it take? Uh, uh, well, this was a one-off example, so it took us a day. Uh, automating, you know, we'll speed it up by however much it does. <clears throat> um, I, I, I guess the, a, a potentially deeper question is <clears throat> to automate a process whereby one uploads uh, MRI data and then looks at results would require that the visualization system make very good predictions about what a user would want to see. And that depends in part on the so sophistication of the user. Uh, so th the naive user might want to see just plain vanilla anatomical data in order in part to see what, you know, what do the organs look like in this vicinity. And the more uh, expert user would already come equipped with that advanced knowledge and would be interested in something more refined. So for a visualization system to know in advance what level of sophistication the user has uh, maybe requires a, a, a dragger. <laughs> yes? Uh, if one has a CD, uh, their own data or something there, uh, is there a way right now Some scanning devices come with uh, uh, applications designed for viewing the resulting data. So that <clears throat> so that's vendor specific, and, and it depends on you know the the clinical setting as to whether you will get a CD that has both an application and your and your data. Uh, it, as far as some canonical visualization tool that accepts a broad variety of data and will automatically generate a view that you like. You know, that still is, is not there yet. I'm sorry, isn't there a place up in South San Francisco developing just that? Uh, developing or that's widely available? It's been, a, it's been available for four or five years now. Oh, well, maybe you know something I don't know. Uh, UCSF Radiological Imaging Labs in use in South San Francisco was taken out, was sold out to another group. I can't remember the name of them right now, but uh, they're off on Oyster Point. So that's a good day for them to have. Uh, I can look it up real quick and see if I can find them. But I know that there's a company that actually reads DICOM, G GE, Toshiba, Hitachi, um, most of the major MRI brands, and DICOM. So it's like, it's pretty universal. I've used it at home on my own PC. Perfect. Give me a second, I'll see if I can find it. Yes. 
uh, healed just fine, and he demonstrated his range of motion before I left for this talk. So, oh, sl arm sling. Yep. Based uh, in part, I think, on cosmetic interests. No scar. Yes. The question, I think, is about the utility of, uh, of these visualization tools for the doctors making the diagnoses. Uh, that is, that's unclear. <clears throat> um, and unclear for a number of reasons. Uh, whether a 3D display is an improvement over 2D display. Uh, th this is an ongoing area of research at the uh, Surgical Planning Laboratory uh, at, at uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital, uh, how to best display in 3D uh, data for making uh, diagnoses and surgical plans. Thank you very much for coming. <clears throat>